everybody. Uh, my name is Allison Giannato. I am the former agency CTO. Um, I, uh, I'm also a security and privacy advocate. Um, I've got about 20 years of experience in IT and software engineering. I know you can't tell, I look so young. I'm also the co-author of a couple of uh, PHP and MySQL books, and I've survived more corporate audits uh, than I care to remember. I'm actually going to talk to you today about security and risk, but I'm not going to talk to you at all about audits. Um, I'm also a snipey head on Twitter, and I'm going to preface this, I'm going to play a video for you. Uh, I'm not endorsing this company, I just like to start off with this particular video because it's funny, and it sort of describes how most people feel about security and risk. Uh, again, I'm not endorsing this company, it's a commercial for them, but anyway. Okay, let's get started by trying to describe computer security in a single word. piece of shit. Yes. Maybe we can watch our language. I'll write down frustrating. Write down shit. Sandwich. Sandwich. Now, why don't you write down f***ing sandwich? Slow f***ing dumpster. Yes, Big f***ing bag. F bag pop-up. That's three words. If you say it fast, it's one word. So, yeah, not endorsing that company. Just think that's hilarious. First of all, the most important thing that you guys should know, and a lot of you guys, obviously, you work in scale, so you already know some of this. Uh, it's impossible to anticipate every risk. Uh, no, seriously, it is. It is also inappropriate to mitigate every risk. Uh, for those of you who do, do any kind of um, security specifically work, you know that part of your job is not just to think of all the risks that could come up, but it's also to evaluate which ones are actually important enough to bother with. So let's take a, a step back uh, and let's look at why people hack. Uh, this isn't really rocket surgery, but bear with me. Uh, the most obvious reason is to sell or steal identities, credit card information, military secrets, corporate secrets. Um, still for fun and notoriety back in the day, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the only reason people really hacked uh, was for bragging rights. That still happens, but it's less common now. Uh, political hacktivision, hack, hacktivision? <laughs> hacktivism uh, is also uh, very, very popular over the last five years or so. Um, revenge as well. Uh, Black Hat SEO, I don't know if any of you guys know what Black Hat SEO is. Basically, the bad guys inject code into uh, your site to steal your delicious Google juice uh, so that uh, basically as Google's crawling your site, Google sees lots of links to their Cialis and their porn sites, and when you pull it up in uh, Chrome or Safari or whatever else, nothing looks wrong. Uh, and extortion and ransomware, we're seeing a definite spike in extortion and ransomware. Some of you guys have probably heard of CryptoLocker and things like that. Um, so the types of uh, vulnerabilities and the types of threats that we know as developers are things like cross-site scrip scripting, CSRF, SQL injection, uh, local file inclusion, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the specifics. I assume that everybody here is familiar with the OWASP top 10, and uh, I don't want this to be a kind of a 101. We've had so many data breaches in the last couple of years that we've actually had to come up with a new name for them. Uh, there's a new classification of breaches called mega breaches. Uh, and these are breaches where the resulting data loss, uh, it, the result is a data loss of the personal details of over 10 million identities exposed in a single event. There were eight mega breaches in 2013 compared to one in 2012. That is an increase of 700%. Uh, October 2013, I'm going to just go through a couple of kind of recent really big, really horrible ones. Uh, Adobe exposed customer data, debit and credit card information, credit card numbers, and their source code. Uh, the impacted number of users was 152 million. Uh, December 2013, Target exposed customer data, uh, debit, credit card information, PIN numbers, impacted 110 million users. So basically, this is what we're seeing. From 2011, we had 232 million identities stolen. Two years later, just two years later, 552 million identities stolen. And the data that's stolen, I'm not sure if everybody can see that, but uh, credit card information, birth dates, uh, government ID numbers, social security numbers, in other words, uh, home addresses, medical records, phone numbers, and so on. So this stuff is really serious. The number of attacks that we're seeing is increasing exponentially as well. Uh, so in 2011, this is per day, 190,000 uh, attacks per day. In 2012, 464,000. And in 2013, just last year, 570,000 attacks per day. 
Uh, and the data from all of this is from the uh, Symantec Internet Security Threat Report, uh, Q1 of 2014. So here's a kick in the ass. Sometimes your efforts to mitigate risk will actually increase your attack surface. Uh, and basically what that means is, for example, when you have uh, a situation, let's say you add some more firewalls, but you don't actually have anybody who's really good at configuring firewalls, so now you've got all of this other stuff that you don't know how to manage. Uh, sometimes, a good example from IT is rotating password requirements, so your IT department has your passwords expiring every 30 days. I don't know if you know what happens when you make people change their password every 30 days, uh, but basically you get a lot of passwords on sticky notes underneath computers. It's not effective. Uh, this is why I don't talk about compliance, because that's one of those things that, that compliance wants you to do, and I think it's dumb. Uh, and de defense in depth is another kind of one of those double-edged swords. We always hear this when we're talking about security. Oh, de defense in depth. And defense in, in depth is important. It's absolutely important. The promise of defense in depth uh, is that you're mitigating single points of failure, bus factor of one. Uh, it also requires more effort on the part of the attacker. The, the term defense in depth is actually a military term that started uh, from tactics that would effectively distribute weakness across a larger geographic area and cause uh, an attacking uh, enemy to lose their resources. They, they would just, it would take so much work to actually get through that it's uh, more or less winning by attrition. Um, the problem is that that's not really the world that we live in anymore, uh, and it's not really a good analogy. That's not to say that defense in depth is not useful. It is very useful and it's very important, but you also need to understand some of those weaknesses. And some of those weaknesses are uh, that you have a larger, more complicated system that is sometimes harder to maintain. We've heard a couple of speakers talk uh, about kind of bigger, unwieldy systems and how flattening the stack can be really helpful. Um, it can also lead to more cracks for bad guys to poke their fingers into. Uh, you also have more attack services that can be overlooked. You know, this is another one of those examples, especially in larger companies or companies that started smaller and kind of kept strapping things on uh, afterwards. What you end up with is a whole bunch of systems that people don't actually know what they do. They don't know when they were patched. There may be, you may not even have people on staff who remember what that machine is for. Uh, and if you're not paying attention to that box, then that box then becomes a new attack surface because it's not being cared for. Uh, and the, the real problem is that the bad guys have limitless resources and we don't. We have actual jobs to do. We have code to write, we have servers to administer, uh, and we, do, we have finite resources. Uh, attacks are commoditized now. This is a real thing. You can rent a botnet for $2 an hour. And some of them actually have their own Facebook pages. I wish I were kidding. But the problem is, and as you guys know as, uh, as scaling folks, uh, hackers are not your only problem. In six years at my last company, we were never hacked. But one line of code cost us $1 million. I didn't write it, I swear. Uh, so we're just going to go over real quick the kind of principles of security and risk management. I'm going to try and go through this pretty quickly because I know that stuff's really boring. Um, but it's called the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, so confidentiality is a set of rules that limits access to information. When we talk about this, we're talking about passwords. We're talking about data encryption, uh, both at rest and in transmission. Uh, Two-factor authentication, biometrics, and uh, I IP whitelisting, for example. Um, now, the problem is that, uh, or not the problem, but some of the things that could compromise your uh, ability to mitigate risks to confidentiality are, for example, no brute force detection, uh, no vetting how third-party systems handle your data or your customers' data. This is a really big one. If you guys remember, uh, there was a Gawker hack, Gawker.com, the Gawker network. Uh, I think it was about three years ago. They got owned really, really hard, and when they finally went through and they figured out what happened, uh, the problem was that somebody had posted the FTP credentials to the Gawker website on Basecamp, and because somebody's Basecamp got hacked, basically it was the keys to the kingdom. Um, so those are real problems. Information leakage from uh, login messages, timing attacks and stuff. I'm still really surprised when I go to log into a web service and it says, uh, you know, that email address was not found. Not your login is incorrect, but that email address is not found. What that means for me as a bad guy is that I can basically just keep trying email addresses. And as soon as I keep trying email addresses, if there's no brute force detection on that system, it's really just a matter of time. I already know that this is a valid email address. I know that this person is in this system. So no brute force detection means 
uh, that basically I can just sit around, write a script, and uh, you know, wait for my, cash to be, for my check to be cached. Um, shared websites across web servers, of course, web, web services. There's not really a lot that you can do to control that. It's just something you need to be aware of. Uh, one thing that was really interesting is like when Adobe was hacked, a lot of people were really angry. They were like, wow, you know, Adobe should have had more harder password requirements, 12 characters with uh, alphanumerics and uppercase and lowercase. And that sounds like a totally reasonable thing to say. The problem is, I don't know about you guys, but when I signed up for Adobe, I used a crappy throwaway password because it was something stupid like, you know, uh, Adobe, Adobe password, whatever. Uh, if you actually give really difficult requirements, the odds are going to be better that I'm going to reuse something that's actually important. So there is kind of a converse side of that. I'm not really sure who's right, um, but I do see the argument there, which is actually that maybe people's butts were saved because Adobe didn't have strong password requirements, and a lot of people aren't. They don't take Adobe very seriously in that, in that context. So it was okay. Uh, another one is improper destruction or disposal of old data. Let's say you have a project that you collected a bunch of user data on, and now that project's done, how are you making sure that you're securely uh, getting rid of that data? Uh, integrity, that's the I in CIA. It is the assurance that the information is trustworthy uh, and accurate. This means maintaining the consistency, accuracy, and trustworthy of data um, throughout its entire life cycle. Uh, this also means that the information is not modified or altered intentionally or by accident. And the by accident part, I think, is really important because I'm sure none of you guys have ever written a SQL query that, for example, didn't have a where clause in it or something. I know I've never done anything like that. Um, so, and, and, you know, also just talking about bad data entry. That's actually a thing as well. Availability, which is kind of your guys' purview, I guess, um, is a guarantee of ready access to the information uh, by authorized people. So, obviously, some pretty obvious examples would be data loss due to hardware failure, uh, DDoS, data alteration uh, via authorized person, so again, human error, a software bug that unintentionally deletes data, which you guys would never do. Uh, no backups or untested backups. So you've, you've got a backup running, but you've never actually tested it. That's as good as not having a backup. That's actually true. Um, so you're saying, okay, well, geez, that sounds really dismal. <laughs> the attacks are increasing. There's nothing we can do. Uh, everything is terrible. So this is your AppSec strategy. <laughs> Except it's not. It's actually not that bad. Um, one thing that I like to do every single time on every project is a creative risk matrix. This is something that I sort of came up with that is a distant sister to uh, kind of the process of threat modeling, which is uh, to identify what your weak points are going to be, um, make sure that you have a plan for when they fail, because they will, uh, and figure out how you're going to monitor these things. So for example, uh, in the risk matrix, and there's a, a link here that you can go to that has an Excel spreadsheet that's just kind of a little starter template. You can add more to it. You can take stuff away. Um, but uh, for example, the type of resource. Is it an API? Is it a JavaScript? Is it whatever it is? Is it a third party uh, resource? Uh, I assume that you guys are all doing architecture diagrams, right? There's nobody in here that has a whole bunch of systems that are completely undocumented, I hope. Uh, so diagram ID, tie it back into your architecture system so that you actually know what these moving parts are and where they live. Uh, the triggering action, is it somebody clicking on a vote button? Is it doing something else? Uh, the consequence of the failure. So, the consequence is important because, for example, if you're using Facebook as a login mechanism, um, part of what this risk mat matrix and any kind of threat modeling, uh, part of that process is figuring out how important that risk is. So Facebook is generally up. If somebody's using Facebook to log into your app, then uh, the probability of that going down is very low, but the impact could be incredibly high. So you may actually want to adjust where it falls in your risk matri matrix because of that. Um, user impact, as we said, so in this case scenario, uh, the user couldn't log in, and that may actually be really devastating for your application. Uh, the method used for monitoring, monitor all the things, all the endpoints, everything that you can possibly, everything that matters, figure out a way to monitor it. Uh, and your efforts to mitigate in case of failure. Sometimes, like in the case of Facebook, there's not really a lot you can do. You can communicate it to the right people, which is why you have contact information. Uh, these are the people to notify when the shit hits the fan. but 
Uh, sometimes you're not actually going to be able to do anything about that. But the, the point is to go through this exercise so that you're not caught by surprise. Because every single one of us in this room, I'm, I'm sure, has had a down server or has had something go horribly, horribly wrong. And you know that that is not the moment where you, you want to be thinking about these critical decisions for the very first time. So I want to leave you guys with stuff that you can do today. Hopefully, you're doing all of these things. And this whole point is, is not going to be very interesting to you. But uh, if you're not, I definitely recommend doing uh, all 20 of these things immediately. Uh, for number one is capture all the flags. Make sure that your development team and your DevOps teams are required, encouraged, whatever, to participate in the capture the flag at least once a year, if not once a quarter. Uh, make it a company thing. You know, have prizes. Whoever wins, there are tons of them online. Um, I can make sure that I post a bunch of links to uh, freely available capture the flag. Uh, things that are running 24-7, 365 days a year, but actually make this part of their process, part of, it, part of the team building, but also uh, make it a thing that they actually have to do. And the reason why is because if you're a developer and you've never run a capture the flag against a web application, there's a ton of shit that we keep asking you to do from a security perspective and you don't understand why. So, for example, uh, in the capture the flag, a developer will learn uh, to strip specific messaging from login forms, like, for example, the login, uh, the uh, username versus uh, login is incorrect. Um, use solid uh, password and salting, like bcrypt. Implement brute force detection. I cannot stress this enough. Brute force detection um, on all login systems. Encrypt everything where feasible. Uh, and suppress debugging information. Uh, there's a developer who's actually in the audience with us today who had never, never done a capture the flag before until I encouraged him to. And, uh, and this is another good lesson, is don't try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, he was trying to break into a web server legally. This was part of the capture the flag. And he started to write a script. And he wrote a script that would pull in all kinds of you know, dictionary tables and all kinds of other stuff. And I said, why are you using that? There's this software that does it for you. And the thing was cracked in seven seconds. So devs don't actually understand how easy this is and how when you leave stuff like what version of PHP or what version of Apache or what version of, oh, OpenSSL, <laughs> when you leave that information hanging out, somebody who has motivation to get in will, will use that to get in. This sounds like really basic rudimentary stuff. I don't know if you guys can see this. But this was screenshotted to, uh, this month. This, was, this is a stack trace on a website. I've obscured the, uh, the URL. But this is a real thing. So not only are they using an arcane way of connecting to a database, but uh, their password is not in environmental variables. Uh, their query is very vulnerable to uh, SQL injection. And look at that MD5 encryption that they've got rocking in the top. So these things are still real problems. Uh, start every project risk first. That means it's not bolted on at the end. Get your stakeholders involved. Get everybody on board. Uh, build a clear inventory of surface areas and their value. There are literally people that I know that have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of servers, and they don't actually know where they live or what they do. Uh, risk matrix for every single major proje project or product. Uh, know what happens when third-party systems fail. They will fail. I promise you they'll fail. So have a plan for that. Trust your gut. When something, looks, uh, when something doesn't look right, it probably isn't. Uh, keep your systems as simple as possible. We've heard a bunch of speakers today talk about kind of simplifying and making systems less brittle. This really does matter. Uh, increased transparency reduces risk across departments. Uh, DevOps is a great example of this. Get to know your user's behavior. Be suspicious if it changes. A friend of mine manages the website for the security and the fraud detection for a website for one of the major banks in the United States. And he processes 4 million log files per hour. And the way that he detects fraud is because he knows what the users usually do. And the moment he sees something that, isn't, that doesn't look right, he knows he needs to pay attention. Automate everything, obviously. Log almost everything. This is another great example of where making yourself more secure can actually increase your attack surface. Don't log social security numbers. Don't log uh, credit card numbers. Don't log usernames and passwords. Always employ principle of least privilege. Only collect the data that you absolutely need, always. A great example was, uh, was the, just, was the uh, One Direction speaker from earlier today. So although this was an architectural decision, not a security decision, that also means that instead of having millions and millions of people's uh, private information, 
in a database, he only had the ones that he needed. Don't ever, don't listen to marketing because they're going to ask you to collect everything, hair color, eye color, favorite fish, whatever. Uh, don't listen to them. <laughs> only collect the information that you absolutely need in order to make your application successful. Uh, Two-factor authentication, Authy, Duo Security, it's actually super easy. There are great APIs out there. Make this an option for your users. Uh, create a data recovery plan and test it. No, I mean really test it. Everybody says that they test it and they don't. Test it more than once. Uh, get your stakeholders to put together a security policy, a data recovery, or a, a business continuity plan. Because when, again, when the shit hits the fan, you don't want to have to be figuring out who you need to talk to and what you need to get done uh, in order to, to get yourself back on track. For those of you who are using frameworks, leverage the internal systems that they have. If you're using Laravel, if you're using Symfony, use their CSRF protection, use their data sanita sanitation. Uh, perform regular white box and bla black box testing. Uh, internally and also pay somebody else to do it. Um, pay attention to your alerts. This is a real problem. The target breach, they were being alerted for like a year. They're like, oh, another one of those. I don't care. I get so many of these. God. If you're getting that many alerts that you're not actually looking at them anymore, something's wrong. Either fix your alerts or fix your server. But the most important thing is to become a passionate security ambassador for your users and for your teams. And that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs>